All right. Any other questions that you guys have? Um, sir, so if you're posting the relevant sections, should we still get the book done or no? Uh, so I'm going to post the relevant sections for homework one. Okay, so we should still get the textbook then. All right. So you should still get it. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and you can hold it against me at the end of the semester. I don't think it's the greatest book in the world, but it's the book we've got. Um, you know, so it, it's, I think, I think what you'll find is that my notes, um, which again, I post my notes on the homepage. Um, you may find those to be more useful, I suspect. Um, the book is a little all over the place with its formulas, in my, in my opinion. It's not very organized. Um, in regards to uh, homework one, um, I believe it was problem number four. Um, I had, I was really struggling on that problem. The rest, um, problem four and five with the MATLAB, um, I went in the book, I saw all the, uh, you know, the extra problems and stuff like that. I tried it to put in the code, but I was still having troubles. Is there any way we could do like an example problem like problem, uh, the homework problem? Um, so we problem, if you're, looking at, if you're looking at problem four, you know, in the homework, um, there is an example that we, if you go into, um, so I, I think it's enough that you guys should be able to figure it out on your own if you look at the examples that I posted in the notes, right? So let's look at that real quick. Um, So for problem four, if I go all the way down here. Um, so problem problem four, if I look for instance at this, like if you if you can follow what what I've done to make this plot, the code that you're generating should be pretty pretty darn similar to what's right here, okay. And I'm, I'm happy to, um, you know, go over some specific questions with you. Um, I've, got, I've got about 15 minutes after this class. So if you can, if you can hang around, then I can go into, into maybe a specific question with you. But I think if you go into the notes for, the, for our first class, you'll, you'll see this code and hopefully that code will help you with it. For problem five, problem five gets into the loops. Um, and that's something I, I'd be happy to talk about offline uh, if folks have questions about that. Okay, thank you so much. Yep. All right, any other questions before we get started? All right. I think pretty much everybody is here, so I'm posting that link again in the chat uh, for everybody to, to get started on the, on the um, attendance stuff. All right, so I want to, we are jumping into basically what is in problem six uh, on the homework today. And it's what we're going to be focusing on all of this week and pretty much all of next week as well, which is complex numbers. All right, now most of you guys should have seen complex numbers at some point in, in your time, probably in high school. You probably haven't seen it in college for the most part. In calculus, they don't really talk about complex numbers very often. It's not that particularly useful, um, but it is extremely useful when it comes to um, issues in, um, um, in uh, electrical and computer engineering. All right, so for whatever reason, Yahoo, I know Yahoo starts 2112, I think with complex numbers. He, mm -hmm. And in 2112, you're gonna do a lot of complex numbers because as, as we find out, and really what we're gonna jump into today is that sine waves and complex numbers are deeply connected, all right? And so it's, um, in this particular class, we're gonna focus on, on the math really of complex numbers. Um, Yahoo is gonna get much more into the application of them um, in, in that particular case. So this is gonna be a little bit more of a mathematical treatment of them uh, than maybe you're gonna get there, okay? But before I jump into it, one of the first questions always is, <laughs> why, why do we deal with, with something that is called imaginary, um, which is potentially problematic, right? So a um, little bit about our game plan for, for the next couple of lectures here. So today is an introduction to complex numbers, all right? Everything that I'm doing here today, I think is pretty basic stuff. Even if you haven't seen it in a long time, or maybe you never even saw complex numbers, I don't think it matters because essentially complex numbers are really no different than vectors. All right. And, and, you know, at a 
basic level, it's just the same thing as what you did in physics when you were talking about vectors, okay? And we're gonna review a lot of that stuff here today. Then we're gonna get into the things that we really use them for, phasers, and then um, next week we're gonna kind of wrap up and do some more examples and problems and such. And then reminder that exam one is coming up on October 1st, all right? So that's uh, basically two weeks from Thursday. Um, and so that will cover complex numbers. So, so basically you got two weeks to really get complex numbers under your belt and, and be ready for that, okay? Again, we'll talk more about the exam details as that approaches. Um, and I, I will give you a practice exam so you can see the format and get comfortable with that, okay? All right, <clears throat> um, I put into the notes here uh, a little bit of, of the content. So in, in chapter four of the book, the material that is, that is important for you um, basically is, is these sections here. So 4.5 and 4.6, we're gonna, we're gonna skip for now. All right, but again, I, I think in terms of what you're gonna need for the homework um, in the short term, I mean, a lot of you guys that ordered the book, you should be getting it. If you haven't gotten it yet, it should be next week. To carry you through homework, one, everything you need should be covered really here today. And, and the notes should really give you everything that you would need, all right? So um, just to just a kind of a key section, chapter four is where complex numbers are talked about. We're skipping 4.5 and 4.6 for now, although we will come back to them, all right, when it's, when it's relevant. All right, so I'm gonna put something up there on the screen. And it looks pretty, pretty alien probably to a lot of people, but really I wanted to talk a little bit about why all this stuff matters. So I talked at the very beginning uh, of the class last week, I guess it was probably Tuesday's class, talking about what is the, 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 the fact that sine waves are really important in the context of electrical and computer engineering, all right? And, and they are. Right, so I said that basically audio waves, right, are, are essentially cosine and sine waves. So if, I, if you thought about an audio wave kind of moving through the air, right, essentially what that waveform is, is it sinusoidally varies, okay? And, and that, that audio wave, uh, radio waves, um, um, you know, power signals are all essentially sinusoidal signals. And there is a really deep relationship between exponentials all right, particularly complex exponentials and cosine and sine. All right, so I'm just throwing something out there which is true and I'm not, I haven't proven it, I haven't talked about it yet, but this thing here is called Euler's identity and I see that identified in the chat where I is the complex number. And I'll throw this out before we even get into this too far. I is the complex number or I should say the imaginary number, all right. What is I equal to? You guys remember? The square root of negative one. The square root of negative one, all right, which is supposedly a number that is imaginary, although it is not. It's probably one of the worst decisions anyone ever made is to call something that is real imaginary. It is a real thing. Uh, it does have some physical meaning, and it just unfortunately it was called imaginary, all right, and so we're, we're going to deal with that. But the thing that's, that's important here is I, was I want everybody to see at the outset that, that, so we said sine waves are important for us in electrical and computer engineering because they represent the things that we deal with. They represent power signals, they represent audio signals, they represent radio signals, all right? And there is this deep relationship between complex numbers and sine and cosine. And that relationship is really important because it allows us to simplify a lot of the work that we do. If this wasn't true, you all would drop out of 2112 right now. No one would be in it because every problem you do would be a differential equation, okay? Complex numbers let us make much simpler things um, with our math. And the lights just turned out on. There we go. All right, back on. All right, <clears throat> so let's explore that idea a little bit, all right? So what I have here actually is a block diagram for essentially what amounts to noise canceling headphones. So if you get the, the newest uh, AirPods, right, the Apple AirPods, they do noise cancellation. And essentially what, what that means is something like what you see right here. So this is a, a complicated block diagram. It's not that complicated. 
Um, but let's see if you guys can sort of figure out what's going on. So I've got a, a microphone here, all right? And then this guy is an amplifier. So essentially this microphone takes a sound signal and converts it into a voltage. And then that guy goes through some circuitry, all right? And so this circuitry here is basically amplifiers of some sort. And this thing called AGC is called an automatic gain control. It's basically a, an amplifier. So another, an amplifier is something that can make a voltage bigger or smaller, okay? So in my diagram right here, I've got a couple of things. I have this thing called a DSP, and I have this thing called a DAC. So let me ask you guys, what is a DAC? Digital to analog converter. Uh, yeah, so a digital to analog converter, right? And what is DSP? Anybody know what that is? Digital signal processor. Yeah, so basically this guy here is a, is a processor of some sort that is able to do digital signal processing. So if you actually opened up an Apple AirPod, you know, which is, you know, small, right? You would effectively see in there a digital signal processor, some sort of an integrated circuit that is capable of, of processing digital signals. And so effectively what it does to try to do noise cancellation is it tries to measure the noise that is present. So it has a microphone right that measures the noise that's present and basically does some analysis using this digital signal processor and then spits out a signal using this digital to analog converter to basically cancel whatever that noise is all right so there's a there's a whole process that this guy goes through to do that so what it does ultimately at the end of the day is is the picture that's shown here all right so what I've, what I've got is, is basically is, is two pictures. Um, so the images here in red on the left are sort of before noise cancellation. And the ones on the right are basically after I've done some noise cancellation. So if I, I mentioned this briefly in kind of our first class about the difference between analog and digital signals, all right? What's important about an analog signal? What defines an analog signal? It's continuous. It's continuous, right? And and continuous means what? It an analog. A, Go ahead. It has an undefined number of states. That sounds fancy, but yes, that's right. Um, so when you say an undefined number of states, basically it means that it, so the, the waveform, this red waveform that I'm highlighting right here, this red waveform is an analog signal, okay? And, and what that analog signal is, to say that it's, it's got those, con those many states that he referred to, right, is to say that any point in this waveform is represented by a real number. And it, it, it's, in other words, I, it could be, you know, so this peak value here is, I don't know, about 1.6, or no, I guess a little bit more than 1.5, right? So that means that it could be 1.5167894322, whatever, right? Some big, long decimal number, right? What we typically do, processing signals in analog is really, really hard to do, right? Why would processing signals in analog be hard to do? If I had an audio signal like this thing that is shown right here, this audio signal exists in the real world, and this audio signal could have been measured by this microphone, okay? Complex. What, what, what makes this thing, how would, I, how would I process that signal if, in analog? What does it mean to do analog signal processing? What do I need to do analog signal processing? Work with infinite values or infinite number of values. And so how could I do that? You have to define your own steps. Well, well you, yeah, you, you, you break it up into the smaller steps first, but you, you know, couldn't really yeah. work with infinite values in a you computer. Can't, you can't work with yeah. infinite values in a computer, at least. How could I do it? I can do it. You have to sample with like an approximate digital you value. Are, you guys are talking about computers. I can't do it with a computer. How else could I do it? Voltage. Uh, you could tie the magnitude of a voltage to another. You're, ta you're talking about computers. I could build a circuit, right? I could build a circuit with resistors, capacitors, inductors, and, and transistors. I could build a circuit that would do it, right? That's, that's how you do analog signal processing is you build circuits. A digital signal processor basically utilizes somehow a computer and it allows us to do a heck of a lot more than, and that's why you guys immediately all went to computer stuff and what you said, because 
a computer is much, much better at, at being able to do, you can do a lot more with it, all right? For instance, what I'm showing you right here, this noise cancellation would never be in an Apple AirPod if it needed to be done in analog. The fact that this thing called a digital signal processor exists is really important. Now, what, what is the key thing that that digital signal processor can do? That's what this figure shows right here. So this is, this is a, an analog signal that is noisy. And that analog signal somehow finds its way into this digital signal processor. And what I have down here is something I call the frequency spectrum of it, all right? A term we're gonna use later called the FFT, all right? And I'm not gonna explain a whole lot about this, but, but essentially it tells me what. What do, what, do you, what do you guys think is the relationship between this top waveform and this bottom waveform? This guy is the frequency spectrum of this. So what do you think this is telling me down here? Uh, it's where the signals are that make up the top signal. Yes, that's exactly right. It's where the signals are that are included in here. In particular, it's where it says basically that there's a bunch of sine waves that are actually inside of this signal and added together to create it. And this bottom waveform is telling me what frequencies those sine waves are located at. Okay. So what this noise canceling, you know, sort of device does is it takes in this audio waveform, basically determines where there are frequencies in the signal, and then uses this, this thing here, this DAC, to basically cancel those signals out, to basically remove them from the frequency spectrum. And so what I get at the end of the day is this thing over here on the right, where my time domain signal looks nice and clean and pretty and smooth, there's some noise, but mostly most of the noise is gone. All right, to do that, what I needed to be able to do is I needed to be able to look at this waveform here in the upper left, and I needed to figure out where the frequencies were, what, what signals were inside of this, what frequencies were they at. I needed to know that to be able to get rid of them. To do that, I needed to basically use something called this fast Fourier transform, all right? And this is a really key algorithm in digital signal processing. The algorithm itself is something that we're gonna talk about later, all right, in the semester, but it basically looks like this. And one of the things that I noticed that is inside of this is, you know, half the letters in the alphabet, I guess, are, are in this, right? But this thing here, X sub N, this would be my audio signal, right? So this is my audio. And this guy here is that frequency spectrum. So this would be from that previous slide, this is the top waveform and this is the bottom. All right, so in other words, this, this one here is the little x, this one here is the big x, all right? Now, lots of stuff going on in here, right? I got k's and pi's and n's and all this stuff, but this i right here, I see something here. I see e to the negative i times something. This guy, this i is the imaginary number, okay? So what that says is that to be able to do what is shown here, for your Apple iPod or your Apple iPod, for your, for your AirPods to be able to do what they need to do, they need to be able to process complex numbers, all right? A lot of things that we do become really simple when we use complex numbers, all right? And they don't, they're not conceptually easy, right? The complex number stuff is conceptually difficult, but it's actually very easy ultimately to utilize, all right? It, they, they help us a lot. So as an example of that, nowadays, you know, digital signal processors. So here's a, here's a sort of a, a, a processor diagram. Nowadays, you know, if you look at a digital signal processor, it's a device that is optimized to be able to do these things, right? And so nowadays we can get processors that, can, that are called complex processors. They can do complex arithmetic. And essentially what it, what it comes down to is to do something like this operation that is shown right here, all right? To do this operation, to calculate one value of this capital X takes in a, in a sort of a traditional processor, a fixed point processor, which I know some of you don't even know what, what that is, but a traditional processor might take something like 
36 different operations, but this complex processor can do in six operations. So even if you're, so you're not fully familiar with, with all the details of that, if I say thir it takes 36 operations to compute one value versus one operation to compute one value, what's the benefit of that? You can do it faster, it takes less clock cycles. Time, it takes a lot less time to do it, right? In other words, you can process stuff a lot faster. So because of innovations like this, right, we are now able to basically build really small DSPs that you can sit fit inside of an AirPod that's that big, all right, that can do all kinds of crazy noise cancellation and different kinds of digital functions, okay? Without that kind of capability, without complex numbers, we wouldn't be able to really do that. And so it's important for us, complex numbers really underlie all of the digital signal processing stuff that we need to do. And nowadays, the, the complex mathematics that we need to do basically somehow get embedded into microprocessors, all right, specifically digital signal processors. All right, I think it's important to understand that stuff and remember it because, you know, one of the natural questions, you know, everybody always asks about electrical engineering, computer engineering is, why do you guys spend so much time on complex numbers? Because they enable us to do a lot of innovative things that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise in a very efficient way. All right, and that's, that's really, the, at the end of the day, why, why all this stuff matters. So we're going to deal with a number of applications, real applications of this stuff, um, particularly in the first project, but, but throughout the whole semester. All right. Um, I'm happy to talk more on some of those things uh, later on if you guys have some specific questions. All right. So I want to, I want to touch on something real, real quick, right? Um, imaginary numbers are a weird concept, right? But I would argue that a negative number is a pretty weird concept too, and you're pretty familiar with that. And hell, even zero is kind of a weird concept, right? Why do people invent numbers? Because numbers can represent things that you can't really imagine in your brain. To count? Afraid? Well, okay, yeah. So that, the, that second answer there is exactly right, to count things. Just, just basically to say, you know, like the image that I've got here, right? You have, you have two apples, I have three apples. Together, we have five apples, right? So people could not at all. So, I mean, so initially, so I, people talked about representing abstract ideas um, and things that are hard to represent. Numbers didn't start that way. Numbers were there to represent pretty concrete ideas, right? Which is to say that I had, you, you know, you have three apples, I have two apples. Together, we have five apples, right? Then, you know, if you think about the people really did not, took them a long time to even come up with zero as a number because zero represents nothing, right? I, I, I can't count zero of something. And so it took people a long time to even figure out what zero was. Zero was a weird number for a long time and not all number systems had it. And, and negative numbers are sort of a similar thing, right? So the example I have here, well, if I have two apples and I take away three apples, I have now negative apples, right? What does that mean? It doesn't have any real meaning. But that's really where I begin to get into some abstract concepts. And it took people a long time to kind of come up with those abstract concepts. So if you look at it over time, I'll just put this in the notes, but basically, People figured out numbers for counting a long time ago, back to sort of, you know, ancient Egypt and, and even before that, it really didn't take until about the 1700s until we basically had the number system that we have now. But you can see for a long time, right, who had zero in number systems, right? This one's kind of interesting here. In ancient China, or not even that ancient, right, right around uh, the turn from BC to AD there, they didn't even have zero because to them it didn't mean anything. To have zero of something was completely meaningless, okay? Even though they had negative numbers, all right? And I, and I throw all that out there because, you know, if you, if you think about this, right, imaginary numbers are maybe a little bit less abstract than they really seem like they should be. At least in, in my, in my, my um, thought, at least, they're a little bit, uh, a little bit more um, uh, a little bit less abstract than they should be. And I noticed somebody put in the chat, Nate there says, negative one apple can represent apple debt. And it can, 
right? Somehow it represents that you owe an apple. And people recognize that there were a lot of ideas that they could represent with these numbers. You guys are fully comfortable with negative numbers, right? But imaginary numbers are just another number that basically we can use to represent ideas that are really important. Ideas that allow us to be able to do cool things like the noise canceling headphones, right? All right. So you first learned them most likely um, imaginary numbers in the concept of um, algebra two or pre-algebra. Uh, sorry, algebra algebra two was where I, where I learned them in high school, right? So our second class on algebra. So if I had a function like this, f of x equals x squared plus one. All right, it looks something like what is shown right here. So you learned something a long time ago. Let's see if you guys remember the fundamental theorem of algebra. What is the fundamental theorem of algebra? Anybody remember? What you do to one side, you have to do to the other. That's uh, you have as many roots as your exponent. You have as many roots as your highest exponent, right? So, so Tim, what you said there is, is pretty fundamental to algebra for sure, right? Whatever I do to one side, I have to do to the other. Right, and, that, and that's actually a good way to, to think of algebra, right, in, in its fundamental um, form. But there is specifically this thing called the fundamental theorem of algebra, which says that the number of roots of an equation has to be equal to the, the exponent, the highest order exponent I have. So if I have x squared plus one, and I say, well, where is that equal to zero? By that fundamental theorem of algebra, how many roots does that guy have? How many times does x squared plus one equal zero? Two. Two. All right. Now there is x squared plus one graphed. All right. How many times does this thing equal zero? Zero. Right? Yeah. I don't see anywhere where that happens. Right. But what you learned, of course, right, is we said, well, x squared equals minus one. So x could be equal to the square root of minus one or minus the square root of minus one. Oops. Right? What we called i and minus i. Now, to actually represent that, I don't think I, I, I didn't bring my, my image here, but essentially what that means, let me ask you guys, how do you think that would be represented? Somehow I should be able to show f of x. What, I, what it means is that x is not just a real number. I don't have all the numbers represented here. All right? What I really need to do is I need to think of X as a complex number, which means that F of X is also a complex number. And somehow to visualize all of this, I need more dimensions is what it comes down to. There is a point that in, in a diagram I can show where at X equal to apparently I and minus I, there is some way to show that this thing equals zero. We just need more dimensions to be able to do it. And those dimensions are useful to us in the context of this digital signal processing idea. All right, so we've got some, we've got some things to, to remember um, you know, from, from high school, and we're gonna see how those concepts from high school, which seemed really weird, are actually pretty useful. All right. All right, so let's begin with the basics. All right, so the first thing is, it's, it is not going to be I for us. It is going to be J, all right? Why J and not I? Do I want to have this? Because we use I for currents. We use I for currents, okay? So we use the imaginary number, I guess. Um, and, and we use this guy, J. Now, the, the important thing about about j here, it's equal to square root of minus one. I, I will probably on a test or something, if you write i, I will accept it, but really in electrical engineering problems, we go with j all the time, right? Um, get yourself used to, to doing that, all right? It's, it's, this isn't really a math class here, it's, it's an electrical engineering class, so we should get used to that, all right? Um, one of the things that, um, that we do is we can visualize these complex numbers in what we call the complex plane. All right. So this guy right here is what I call the complex plane. 
All right, the complex plane has a real axis and an imaginary axis, okay? And in this case, I'm saying I have some imaginary number. In this case, it is, I've called it Z. All right, I always write my Zs with a little um, uh, a bar in the middle of them, okay? It just, to, just so I can tell the difference between my Zs and my twos. So in this case, I've defined Z to be A plus JB, all right? And so we, we make two definitions here. A is the real part of Z, and B is the imaginary part of Z, okay? And you'll notice that, um, so turn the lights back on there. Um, you'll notice here with this guy that J is not part of the imaginary part, all right? In other words, I don't, A is the real part, and the B that multiplies the J is the imaginary part. All right, JB is not the imaginary part. B is the imaginary part, okay? We Dr. represent, Cox. yeah, what's up? A quick question, is a complex plane just um, have the same capabilities as our X and Y plane, as in like projection of B? And it, it does. Um, if, you, if you think about this, this there's no difference um, than from vectors really, all right? And one way to think about this is the J, so if I write something as A plus JB, in some level, what I'm talking about with that A plus JB is that the J is like a unit vector, right? It's like the Y hat unit vector. Um, and so it, it's, it's really just the same sort of idea. So, so what that means is, you know, I could represent this number potentially as thinking of it as uh, Z is equal to A, oops, A, comma B, right? And so this, this height here is B and this length here is A, all right? So I can make those relationships pretty easily. Um, all right, so it's, it's, this is just like a vector, right? If you drew a vector that had an X hat component, a Y hat component, it would look exactly like what we've shown right here, okay? So what I've, what I've shown here is what we call the Cartesian or the rectangular form of, of these numbers. There is also what we call the polar form, which is to say I don't necessarily have to represent things as a real and imaginary part. I could represent them as a magnitude and an angle. So let me ask you guys this. Based on what I've shown right here, right, how would I figure out, how could I represent this number in a different way, right? How could I represent this in what I call polar form? What would be my a way of doing that? So if I, if I said I've, looks like if I, if I look at this picture here, it's like I have a triangle, right? A triangle that has a length on one side of A and a length on one side of B, right? If I'm looking at this, how, do I, how could else could I represent this thing? You'd use the angle and the length of Z? Yeah, I use the magnitude and the length of, of, this, of this hypotenuse here that I've highlighted, all right? So um, in this case, what we do is I can say, I can represent this thing using essentially what, what I call here um, the polar form. So Z equal to A plus JB, this, this is what I call rectangular form. This is my rectangular. And this is what I call my polar form, okay? Where I basically represent this guy by its magnitude and its angle, okay? And so I, I use those bars here to represent magnitude. And I use this angle uh, to represent the angle of it, all right? And, and I, um, if I look at this, sometimes that angle of Z um, often I'm going to call it phi, not theta, but phi. Um, theta is a little bit more common in uh, uh, calculus and, and in physics, but phi is, tends to be the, the variable that we use in electrical engineering. And we'll, we'll see why a little bit later on, but um, that, I'll typically use that. All right, so um, what I've done here, this, so this number, Z equals A plus JB, that means the real part is A. That's the, that's the length of this side, right? 
and the length of this side is b, okay? So looking at that, just from the, from the definitions of a triangle here, what are some of the definitions we can see from this? What do I know about the magnitude of z? How does that have to relate to a and b? a squared plus b squared. a squared plus b squared square rooted, right? a squared plus b squared square rooted. That's Pythagorean theorem, right? There's nothing much to remember about that. All right, so one of the things that I say, there's a, the book tends to have lots of formulas, but you'd only need a couple of formulas to really know how to do any of this stuff. It's a triangle. And so to know the, the length of the hypotenuse, I need to know the Pythagorean theorem, right? How do I figure out the angle here? What's, what's the triangle relationship I need to be able to do that? If I look at this from a triangle perspective, I have the tangent of phi. Tangent is always equal to what over what? The over A. The what? Opposite over adjacent. So B over A. Yep, opposite side length over adjacent side length. So in, in this context, it would be B over A. Okay, like that. And I can similarly figure out a couple of other things here, right? Um, I can figure out that the sine of phi and the cosine of phi have relationships as well, right? Oh, oh, oh. All right, cosine of phi. All right, so what's the, what's the definition of sine of phi? North over hypotenuse. It, well, yeah, so it's over hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is on the bottom. In this case, the hypotenuse is the magnitude of Z, right? That's the magnitude of our complex number. And it's, you said, opposite or adjacent on top? Opposites. Opposite, right? So I put B on top. What's, what's cosine of phi? Adjacent over hypotenuse. Adjacent over hypotenuse, okay? And, and that tells me something really important right there. If I look at, at, at everything that I just wrote, so Z equals A plus JB. And I can see from this that A, the real part, is equal to the magnitude of Z times cosine phi. And I can see that B, the imaginary part, is the magnitude of Z times the sine of phi. All right, so... That means another way I can write this complex number here, um, Z equals A plus JB, is I can write it as magnitude of Z times cosine phi plus J times magnitude of Z sine phi, like that. All right, so a um, Couple of key things there that, that we learned. So that's basically all we need to know to get the relationships. Every equation I would ever need to be able to relate these things. I, what you're gonna learn from me as I, as I go through this, I don't like to know a lot of equations because if I know this, if I know the Pythagorean theorem and I know this, then I know everything else on the screen right now. All right, and I, I find that really important to, to know, right? I can always work out what these relationships are um, very easily if I remember the basics of, of a right triangle, okay? All right, um, I'll stop there. Any questions right now? All right, tricky thing here is angles. Okay, I'm going to come, I'm gonna come back to, to the slide I just had there. I'm going to skip it and then come back to it. Let's say I want to do a couple of examples here. So let's say I gave you a complex number 3 plus J4, and I want to convert that to polar form. Okay, all right. So if I want to convert that to polar form, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask, where is this guy? Where would I draw 3 plus J4? Which quadrant? Quadrant yeah, one. First, first quadrant, right? So here's, and first of all, let's remember our quadrants. This is one... Wait, second quadrant. It went negative. Second, second quadrant. Well, I, I, I flipped the slides there. All right, this is two. This is one. All right, this is three. And this is four. All right. So three plus J4 would be like here. All right, something like that. All right, so in other words, I want to figure out what this angle is, phi, and I want to figure out what this length is, Z. All right, so you guys tell me, how do I figure out magnitude of Z? 
based on everything we've just done? How do I, knowing that this guy is a, is a, is a triangle. So just, just remember this guy here, this is four and this is three, right? How do I figure out, again, not knowing any formulas, just, I mean, I guess knowing that I got a triangle here, what is the square. magnitude of Z? Five. Three squared plus Five. four squared. Yep, three squared plus four squared. All right, so I could calculate what that's gonna be. I could put that in my calculator, put that in the MATLAB. How would you figure out what the angle is? So the so phi being the angle of this Z, what is that? How would I figure that out from what I've give, been given? Inverse All right, I'm gonna start with, yeah. So, so you guys said a couple of things there. So tangent of phi is equal to four over three. So phi equals arc tangent of four over three, like that. All right, now, how did I, how do I calculate that? So I'm gonna keep this stuff. So I wrote again, and I'll post this script. I wrote a MATLAB script to help me out with it, okay? And I got a couple of examples in my MATLAB script, but hopefully you guys can see what I've got here. So Z equals three plus J four. And I calculated the magnitude by doing, in MATLAB I do square root, S-Q-R-T, squirt, of three to the power two. So I do a little carrot to raise to a power, all right? And then I did the angle, MATLAB has a function called ATAN, which calculates the, the inverse tangent for me. All right, now, I have this thing here times 180 over pi. Why do I have 180 over pi? To convert to degrees. So I can convert to degrees, right? And MATLAB does everything by default in radians. And there is no button in MATLAB to change from radians to degrees. If you don't like what I did here, I always multiply by 180 over pi or pi over 180, I guess because I'm old, right? Um, but what I could have done is I could also have said, that Z angle is equal to radians two degrees, rad two degrees of this expression. And that would do it for me as well, all right? And I, I mentioned before, I always tend to, to, to do everything in degrees because degrees have meaning to me, right? If somebody says, I'm, I, you know, I got something that's at 1.6 radians, that doesn't mean a whole lot to me, but 45 degrees does. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, I, I like to think of things in that context. Now, if I wanted to, to check my answer, I could go through here and I could right click evaluate and boom, it gives me my answer. So it tells me that the, um, that the angle here is 53 degrees and the magnitude is five, right? So this guy is about 53 degrees and the magnitude is five. Okay, so that problem's relatively simple, all right? However, what if I give you this problem, all right? I wanna do negative three plus J four, all right? This is a different story now, negative three plus J four. How do I deal with negative three plus J four? Where's that guy gonna be? Second quadrant. Second, second quadrant. quadrant, yep, Intern. second quadrant. Yeah, so he's gonna be, he looks pretty similar. He comes up like this. So this is negative three here. And this is, this length here is four. All right. So we know without doing any work here, what's the length of this side? Five. Five, right? Because it's gonna be negative three squared plus four squared square rooted. That's the same thing as what I had before. It's the same, if I look at the picture of the triangle, it's the same triangle just flipped over the axis, right? So I basically just have the same thing I had before. The magnitude of that side is not gonna change, right? So Z is apparently equal to five with some angle, right? And we don't know what that angle is yet. So how should I figure out the angle in this case? Any ideas? Um, do the inverse tangent of four divided by negative three and add 180 degrees. Yeah, do the inverse tangent. So just to, to write, this, write this out here real quick. The problem we have, so inverse tangent of four 
over negative three like that. So it tells me that phi equals inverse tangent of four over negative three. If I look at that, this is not the right answer, right? He just said add 180 degrees and that's right. We've got a little bit of an issue here. The arc tan function, right, tan inverse, if you plotted that, right, tan inverse of x, if you plotted it, you see that the minimum value it can ever take is minus pi over two radians or minus 90 degrees. And the largest value it can take is 90 degrees. So the reason I find this to be important and the reason why I talk about it is if you look at what's there, all right, it can only represent angles between minus 90 and 90. Where does that exist in the complex plane? Where, where, where are vectors that have angles between 90 degrees and negative 90 degrees? Just the top two quadrants. Uh, quadrant one and four. One and four. All right. So arctan can only define for me things that exist over in quadrants one and quadrants four. If I'm in two and three, they don't exist. All right. That typically is the kind of thing that on exam one, um, I, I would get half of you um, get something wrong, all right, on exam, on exam one, all right, because you won't, you won't remember this, all right. The issue that I run into is if I need to compute the angle of something that is in the second or third quadrant, all right, what I need to do is I need to add 180 plus the arctan of the imaginary part over the real part like that all right i always add 180 degrees go back on for me all right all right lights don't want to turn back on all right if i'm over in the second and third quadrant i need to remember to add 180 degrees one thing that i recommend that you do always is you think about where your complex number is located you should plot it for yourself so that you do that check because otherwise you won't know Okay. And so in this case, I, uh, the reason I plotted it was because now I see he's over in the second quadrant. So I know that I have to add 180 degrees on top of it. All right. So um, in MATLAB, all right, here's my example two. I have negative three plus J four. And if you look at it, what I did was essentially I, I added in here this I added 180 degrees to the angle, okay? But the other thing that I did was I used a couple of functions here that MATLAB has. So I used this function called abs and this one called angle. MATLAB's function called angle, what it does is it computes the angle for you and it takes care of this, um, what, this thing about whether or not it's in the second or third quadrant, okay? So let's run that. So let's run in MATLAB. <coughs> if I go here and I run get my command window up and get this guy up and they should be sitting apart from each other. All right, so let's run example two here. So if I run example two, first I'm gonna just run this part of it, right? Where I did it by hand, all right? And it tells me the angle is 126 degrees. And I just do a mental check on that. Where's an angle of 126 degrees? Well, I, 126 degrees should be in the second quadrant. All right, you should be able to remember that. And then if I run this code right here, where I say abs of Z and angle of Z and evaluate those, I see that I get the magnitude is five and the angle is 126 degrees. So I got the same result, all right, in both cases, all right? You guys follow that? All right. So one, one recommendation I have to you, always follow very carefully, always plot them. All right, always think about where they're located to do a check to see whether your angle is correct. Classic thing people do is they forget that the, that your, that arctan is only defined in these first and fourth quadrants. And so if you get vectors that are over here, suddenly everything becomes problematic, okay? 
you need to remember to add 180 when you're over here. All right. So, hey, Professor. Yeah. Uh, I have somewhat of an emergency. Uh, is it okay if I leave early? Sure thing. Okay, I'll email you uh, and then after. All right. Okay, thanks so much. Hope, hope everything's all right. Um, so a couple of key functions in MATLAB um, that, that we used and are actually in that func the script that I gave you there. There's a function called real, function called imaginary. Real takes the real part of a complex number. Imag here takes the imaginary part. Abs takes the magnitude. Angle takes the angle. And what's important about, about angle is the fact that it, it, um, it takes into account this tan minus 180, or this, this arc tan part plus the 180 degrees. It takes into account that plus 180, whether it's needed or not. Now MATLAB also has a function called phase. What phase is gonna do, and what's different about phase than angle, angle will tell you angles between zero and 360 degrees, all right? Phase will tell you between minus 180 to 180. All right, now, very often you will see me ask for things between, <coughs> excuse me, minus 180 and 180 as opposed to zero to 360. And there is a reason for this, all right? In, in the context of our electrical and computer engineering problems, phase tends to be between minus 180 and 180. And that's because of the way that capacitors and inductors behave, all right? We, we tend to have angles in that range rather than zero to 360. They're completely identical, all right? But, but it's important to, to note. So, I throw those out there because you're going to want to use those to potentially to, to help you check your answers as you go through the homework, right? Those are some really key functions for dealing with complex numbers in, in MATLAB. All right. Um, moving on, right? So arithmetic operations, addition and subtraction. So as it turns out, certain forms of the complex number are easier for some operations and other forms are easier for other operations. Okay, so if I look at adding and subtracting, adding and subtracting of vectors is, of complex numbers is exactly the same as adding and subtracting vectors, all right? So in this example, I have four plus, all right, it has i, right? So four plus i or four plus j, and I have five plus four i or five plus four j, right? Um, or sorry, actually the two that I'm adding, I'm adding this guy and I'm adding that guy. I add them exactly like I add vectors, right? So if I'm adding these guys exactly like I add vectors, the answer is five plus four I, how did I get to that? How did, how did, how did these guys four plus I and one plus three I, how did that become five plus four I? What do I need to do? You add the real parts and the imaginary parts. Yep, you add them separately, right? And so it's written out here, right, to get to the answer. Just like you would add two vectors, right? Um, if you were, you had, you know, four x hat plus one y hat plus one x hat plus three y hat, you would do this, the same sort of idea, all right? The real parts combine, the imaginary parts combine, okay? All right, <clears throat> now, to be able to talk about subtraction, or sorry, multiplication and division, what I'm gonna introduce here at the, in our last 15 minutes is something I talked about at the very beginning, which is this idea of what I call Euler's identity, all right? There is this relationship that exists. I'm not gonna prove it here. You can look in section 4.4 in the book to prove how e to the j angle is equal to cosine angle plus j sine angle, all right? That can be proven using the Taylor series expansion of cosine and sine. All right, if you, if you remember the, what a Taylor series expansion is, then you can go back and you can look at the proof of that. The proof of it isn't all that particularly important, but the value of the expression that's there on the screen is incredibly critical, all right? And, and we use it all the time, all right? What, what we can do too, right? is I can expand that guy a little bit and I can write and say, if I multiplied both sides by a magnitude, 
then the, or just by some number, let's say that number was R, this has to be true just by what we know about equation balancing, right? So we can use that quite a bit um, as, we, as we go through, and we're gonna use that all the time. This is, you know, there's very few formulas that you should ever remember. This one here, I expect that you will memorize that one because it's crucial, all right? Euler's identity is key to everything, all right? It's key to everything that we do, and we're gonna use it here, all right? So ultimately, um, Euler's identity leads us to a third form of a complex number, which is this, what I call complex exponential format. So we have rectangular format, we have polar format, and we have the complex exponential format, all right? And those are all related to each other. And in fact, it turns out we already kind of knew this format here because we said something already. If I have this complex number that's written out on the screen, right here, all right? If I had, I called this guy, you know, this here is A, this length is B, right? We already said Z equals A plus JB. And if I, if I look at this, we said a couple of things already about this. The, what did we say about A? Just from knowing what we know about, about triangles, right? Sine of, of phi, has to be equal to what over what? B over the magnitude of Z. B over the magnitude of Z, right? So B over the magnitude of Z. And cosine of phi better be the adjacent, so A over the magnitude of Z, right? So that told me right there is, this guy can be written as magnitude of Z times cosine of phi plus J sine of phi. Again, if I know this relationship here, if I know these relationships about triangles, that leads me directly to this relationship. And if I know Euler's identity, how can I write this guy now? How can I simplify this expression using Euler's identity? So there's Euler's uh, identity. You use J phi? Yep, E to the J phi, all right? So I can represent this complex number in three different ways, all right? I know this is coming at you fast. We're gonna basically be dealing with this the rest of this week and into next week, right? But it's a really, really key concept is that this, this number can be represented in that format, all right? Now, that's helpful to me in a couple of ways, right? So some rules about exponential manipulation, all right? A complex exponential is just an exponential, right? So A and B here, as, as I've drawn out here, are just, are just uh, they, they could be complex numbers, right? Meaning they could be um, imaginary and real rather than just real, okay? So if I have E to the A times E to the B, what does that become? How do I combine? E to the A plus, e to the a plus B. Yeah, E to the A plus B, right? That we should have known since high school, right? And E to the A over E to the B is equal to what? E to the A minus B. E to the A minus B, right? So that's a pretty important result right there. It also tells me if I, if I had um, a number here, let's say the number was magnitude of Z. On this side, I would just multiply it by magnitude of Z, right? Like that. So how can I use that? Let's say I've got <clears throat> two complex numbers that I can write like this. Z1 is a magnitude times e to the j angle, and z2 is a magnitude times e to the j angle. So let's say I asked you now, what is z1 times z, z2, right? If, if I did that. It would be uh, z1, z2, e to the uh, j, uh, z1 plus j, z2. Yep. Or, no, sorry, j times z1 plus z2. Like that. Right? Yes, I got And if I had Z1 divided by Z2, I'd have, so Z1 magnitude times E to the J angle Z1 over Z2 magnitude E to the J angle Z2. What's that become? 
magnitude of <clears throat> Z1 divided by magnitude of Z2. What do I do to the exponentials there? The J angle of Z1 minus angle of Z2. Angle Z1 minus angle Z2. Like that. Okay. So, so that tells me if, if I wanted to, um, let's call this guy Z3 and call this guy here Z4, right? If, if you look at that, if I said to you, all right, well, what's the magnitude of Z4? Well, the magnitude of Z4 looks like it has to be what? Well, let's take a one to Z two. Well, yeah, let's take let's take a step back here for a second, right? So, if I said to you, let's take the magnitude of Z one. So, magnitude of Z one. So, let's take the magnitude of both sides. All right. So, if I said, let's take the magnitude of both sides like that. All right. The magnitude of Z one is equal to the magnitude of Z one, magnitude of Z one, times the magnitude of e to the j angle Z one, like that. How do I get the magnitude of that e to the j angle z1 guy? How would I get that? Let's take the magnitude of the complex number cosine angle z1 plus j sine angle z1. If I said, what's the magnitude of that, right? What does that have to be equal to? Has to be one, doesn't it? Has to be one. Why does it have to be one? Is it continuous? It has to be one because uh, the cosine uh, and the sine together they kind of invert each other. Yeah, kind of sine squared plus sine squared. Yeah. Yeah. They. They. Yeah. What do I know about cosine squared plus sine squared of the same angle? One. Yeah, it's a trigonometric identity. Yep. It's the only one, it's the only trigonometric identity that matters. All right. The only, the only trigonometric identity that you ever need to really know is the cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to one. The rest of them don't really matter all that much. So when I look at this, if I have num, so I have numbers Z1 and Z2 multiplying an exponential. If I look at that real quick, it tells me that the magnitude of this guy, so let's do specifically um, this Z3 right here, okay? The magnitude of Z3 has to be what? Based on this expression. The magnitude of Z1 times magnitude of Z2 times one? Yep, magnitude of Z1 times magnitude of Z2 times one. Yeah, exactly, times the one for the exponential. If I look at the angle here, right? The angle of Z3, what's the angle of Z3? Well, the magnitudes, so these numbers here, so magnitude of Z1, magnitude of Z1, Z2, those magnitudes are always real numbers, right? So basically I'm saying, all right, what's the angle of a real number? So this is a real number, this is a real number, this is a complex number. The angle of a real number is always zero. So the angle of the whole thing is angle of Z1 plus angle of Z2, like that. Okay, so to multiply complex numbers tells me that I multiply their magnitudes and I add their angles, okay? About division here, what did I learn about division here? The, the magnitude when I divide, I divide the magnitudes. What do I do with the angles? You subtract them, don't you? You subtract them, right? So essentially, the reason I like to use this complex exponential format is if I know this complex exponential format, I don't need to memorize these rules about, well, okay, so when I'm, at, when I'm multiplying, that means I add the angles, or subtract the angles, right? I don't, need to, I don't need to memorize any rules because I just know what I already know about exponentials, okay? Let's use that here in this Professor, example. Uh, I got a question. Yeah. Um, so back on that other slide, like, uh, for finding the magnitude of e to the j z1, I mean, are there cases where it's not going to just always be like one? The magnitude. magnitude? Because like if, 
Because on the like Euler identity, it shows like z1, the magnitude is equal to magnitude yeah. so, so z1. When I, if I'm, if, the, if I'm looking, magnitude. if I'm looking at just this e, this exponential guy right here, his magnitude is always one. Mathematically, okay, so it can't I mean, be anything else because of cosine. Yeah, it can't, right. so like, it can't be not, anything else. So that's like an implied thing that we don't really have to go through like this sure. whole process, right? That's right. Okay. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So using that, I can go straight to, to using that here. So let's look at this guy. So I want to do, let's say I want to do Z1 times Z2. All right. Z1 times Z2 with this, with this set of numbers here. All right. So I look at that, I just do it like this. I just say I got three e to the j 45 degrees times four e to the negative j 90 degrees. I shouldn't have to edit my notes there. It shouldn't say angle. It should say negative 90 degrees like that. All right. Why don't we just do it like this, right? So I got, looks like I got three times four times e to the j 45 degrees times e to the negative j 90 degrees, like that. What's the magnitude of that whole thing now? 12. 12, right? Just three times four. What's the, how do I figure out the angle? Well, I have an exponential. So I basically this to me looks like I've got e to the a times e to the b, right? E to the a That's times 45 e to the b. minus 90. Yeah, so e to the a times e to the b becomes e to the a plus e to the b, right? So I get 12 times um, e to the j, 45 degrees minus 90 degrees, which becomes minus 45 degrees, okay? Now, I can put that in MATLAB as well. And so I wrote another little function here. So this example down here, right? Z1 is three times, now notice what I did. I just put it, I just said times EXP. That's the exponential function, right? Exponential of J and again, everything in MATLAB assumes it's radians. So notice what I did. I converted the 45 degrees into radians by multiplying by pi over 180. I could have used that radian to degree function that I introduced up here, right? Or degree to radian, right? And then I did the same thing for Z2. And then what I did is I just multiplied Z1 times Z2. I take the abs of that, that gives me the magnitude. I take the angle of that, and that gives me the angle, all right? So you're gonna be in, in homework one, right? This is about as complicated as it gets, right? We've got more to talk about, a lot more to talk about when it comes to complex numbers. But, but being able to manipulate these things is relatively straightforward. And as I laid out at the beginning, relatively important, right? Uh, because they, they simplify a lot of things that we do architecture wise and, and the architecture that we, that we utilize in, in our computers, um, particularly in, you know, you have a computer essentially sitting in that Apple AirPod, right? And so if you think about it, it, it really is very enabling. It allows us to simplify a lot of stuff. And the key thing is this relationship that exists called Euler's identity that relates sine and cosine to complex numbers, all right? And, and that is gonna be a really key thing that we exploit throughout the rest of the semester and really throughout the rest of your entire career, all right? So that's where we're gonna end it um, today, all right? And I will hang out here for the next, uh, I don't know, um, 10 to 15 minutes if you guys have questions. Uh, I've got a question. So you uh, you were using MATLAB for the complex number stuff. Uh, should we we be using that to solve this number six on the homework, or should we, we be doing them by hand? So so one of the things that um, that I I pointed out in several of my announcements is when it comes to the exam. All right, when it comes to the exam, you better be able to show that you can do stuff by hand, right? Um, what I recommend that you do is you do everything on number six by hand. In fact, everything on the homework you should do by hand that you can. So, I mean, problems one, two, three, and um, I guess one two, one, two, three, and six, you should be able to do by hand, right? Four and five are, are explicitly MATLAB questions. Thank you. Uh, you know, you can check your answer using MATLAB, 
right? And I recommend that you do, right? Um, but you should be able to do it by hand. And on the exam, I would specifically say, you're going to have to show me your steps so that you show me that you know how to do it. Definitely. Perfect. All right. But, and I, this is part of the reason why I recommend to just get out of using your calculator and try to use MATLAB because it's a lot easier to write out a script like I did there and, and see where the problems are and edit that a lot easier. It's, it's a lot more flexible than your calculator is. You may not be comfortable with it, right? But, but once you get comfortable, you'll see that it's a lot more flexible. Perfect, thank you. All right, other questions? Uh, yeah, I was the guy earlier talked about the homework. Yep. Um, so I guess I narrowed down my question. It's not really about the math lab. It's about the, you asked for the expansion of the, uh, the, uh, problem number, uh, I think it was a uh, 2D. Yep. That's right. Or 3D. Yeah. And, um, I'm wondering how to get the period from that expansion. So once once you do that expansion, you should have gotten that there were two terms in the expansion, right? You should have, you should yes. have had a sine plus a cosine, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if you look at the sine and the cosine, they have the same argument, right? Mm -hmm. What's the, what's the period of that guy? Uh, okay. So, well, the period for that would be, uh, I think it was a uh, one over 50. Uh, I'm not trying to give away answers here, but um, uh, anyways, so yeah, that was the period I was trying for the entire night. And it was saying I was getting the wrong value. So I guess it is a math lab question then. Um, if it's, I, a math, it's a math problem. It's not a math lab problem. You, you, you got the wrong. So what you should see, I'll tell you, I'll tell it to you this way. The frequency, the frequency should end up being two times what the frequency of the of the original problem is I, I forget what it I forget what it is um, but if I looked at the problem am I still tell you what I'm gonna stop the recording.